So I appreciate you being here. I'm Ellen Miller. I'm executive director of the Sunlight Foundation, although I've had a long and close association with Campaign for America's Future. So I'm delighted to be here to, uh, to introduce this panel called The Cost of Corruption Campaign, uh, the defining issue in 2006. And there are many of us uh, who've worked on the issue of campaign finance reform, the role of money in politics, the influence of special interests uh, for decades who think that indeed this is the year in which this issue uh, will play um, in, the, in the election. Um, as I said, I've been in this world uh, for about 20 years, and I know that what I have done has been a piece of what will solve this problem, but I also know it's not enough. So I asked one of my colleagues to tell me how things have changed in the last 20 years. In 1984, the winning cost of a U.S. House race cost $281,000, and in 2004, the average winning House race cost just over a million dollars. Haven't made much progress there. A Senate race in 1984 cost $2.3 million. The average winning Senate race in 2004 cost $7.2 million. <laughs> in 2004 it cost $518,000 to beat a U.S. House incumbent, and 17 incumbents lost that year. I remember thinking that was the year in which we thought, you know, that we had the uh, re-election rate was higher than the uh, Russian um, parliament, parliament or whatever we call it. In 2004, the, house, the cost of beating a House incumbent rose to $1.6 million. And even at that price, only five incumbents lost their races. So um, things uh, haven't gotten better, uh, so we need to try some, something new. Um, uh, let's see, there, there are a couple of other statistics that I think are sort of interesting. Uh, men still give the overwhelming dollars, uh, majority of dollars. In 2004, women gave 29% of all federal campaign dollars, compared with 22% in 1990, so some progress, but I don't think any of us would call that a real progress. Um, and small contributions, a lot of people are talking about the rise of small contributions. They are still only a tiny proportion of the fundraising pie for congressional races. Um, and they're staying pretty much about the same. Uh, about 10% of the money that comes in for House races comes in contributions of under $200, and about 15% for Senate races. But probably the most important thing is uh, that those who give money to political campaigns, those who expect money in return, and indeed, as we now know, because of all the recent exposés, are getting a whole lot for their money, that pool of donors hasn't changed at all. They still come from the finance, the insurance, the real estate industries. They come from lawyers and lobbyists. They come from every manner of special interest. But in part, as indicated by the small donor contributions, they are not coming from people like us. So it is time to make a fuss about it. Uh, and the first person I'd like to invite to make uh, to talk about the kind of fuss he wants to make and his organization wants to make is Eli Prisoner from MoveOn.org. Uh, good morning, everybody. I'm actually going to be very brief. Uh, I was going to say uh, that the rest of the people on the panel know far more about corruption than I do, but I really can't <laughs> exactly what I meant. Um, <laughs> But I just want to talk about one of the very hopeful things uh, that we're seeing about this issue. Uh, there are a lot of people in Washington who will tell you that corruption as an issue doesn't work. People don't care about this kind of process stuff. It doesn't really make an impact. And uh, so this spring, with the help of thousands and thousands of Move On members who are contributing and the millions of members across the country, uh, we set out to see if that actually was the case. And we did a ad campaign called Hot Red Handed, which was basically drawing the link between the money that representatives took from various industries and the votes that they, that they voted that hurt people in those districts in a personal and tangible way. And so I just wanted to share with you uh, the ads. Um, so this is the world's shortest PowerPoint. I think I've got three slides. First, the ads. And for that, I'm going to try to figure out this. Hmm. Yeah, 
Is this the world's shortest PowerPoint? Yeah. <laughs> 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 Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, this is especially embarrassing for me. I feel like I'm the last person in this. <laughs> Technical. <laughs> All of the rest of us feel much better. Yeah. yeah. Let's see. Any what? Hmm. Uh, hey, Casey, do you remember the script of the app? Here's <laughs> <laughs> the guy that made the ad right here. Congresswoman Delma Drake. She accepted more than $30,000 from energy. Okay. Um, yeah, let's see. We'll try something kind of funky. <laughs> okay, we're going to try a sort of mixed medium approach here. There we go. Okay, I'm going to try both of these. Uh, <laughs> energy companies, and she voted against bills that would penalize those companies for price gouging. Instead of protecting us, Congresswoman Drake has been caught red-handed protecting oil company profits while we pay more at the pump. Tom DeLay, Dick Cheney, Jack Abramoff, and now Thelma Drake, another Republican <laughs> caught red-handed. MoveOn.org political action is responsible for the content of this episode. <laughs> So that was a little off in time here. Yeah, it's still finishing up. But um, anyway, this is this is the ad that we ran, and what we did was we picked four districts where uh, we 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 knew that people would resonate with this message if only they heard it. And uh, so I want to talk uh, for a moment about the effect. We're very serious about testing and move on. We want to make sure that the money that we spend actually makes the kind of impact that we need to make. And so what we did was we tested in a control district, very similar to the districts where we ran the ads before and after. And then we tested uh, with polling before and after in the districts where we ran the ads. And this is an example of what we saw in one of these districts. <coughs> Opens up in the race. Johnson drops to about 41 points in the polls. Uh, Murphy, her opponent, who's a Democrat, goes to about 50 points in the polls. You don't see shifts like that every day in politics. And uh, it's a very exciting example. It, for me, it makes me very hopeful because it means that if we expose this stuff, we really can get people engaged, that Americans are not uh, willing to let this slide if they know what's going on. And so just a brief thing about what made, made these ads work. One is that they expose this connection between the corruption that's happening and how people vote. You can't just talk about the corruption in isolation. You need to connect it to what people see and feel in their lives at home. The gas prices, pharmaceutical drug prices, uh, defense contracting and, and war profit sharing. These are things that people feel in their lives. Uh, the second thing is we, we use bold visual imagery to get the, the task across. And that was really all uh, Casey here, who's in the front row, who's our, the mastermind behind a lot of our ads. I just <laughs> Uh, the third thing is we tested the ads before we ran them so that we knew that we knew that they were. And the fourth is we picked districts where we felt like this message was really going to get across. And what we've seen is that since we started with these ads, all four of the districts where we're running these ads have been put in the competitive column for 2006. They weren't there before, they're there now, and I thank you all of you. The final thing that I want to say about these ads is that part of what makes them effective is that instead of having big businesses going on the air to defend candidates, instead of having super wealthy millionaires going on the air, they had move on members. They had regular people who were from these districts and from districts all across the country. And that was an extremely strong point. When, these, when the, when the uh, Congress people would, would attack back, and you know they do, uh, we were able to say, look, this is coming from people in your district, regular people who are, who are fed up with what you're doing. And we're going to get the word about this, and we're going to make sure that you face the consequences for it this November. And uh, that's the campaign, and I'll, I'll cede the floor to, to these corruption experts. <laughs> creative use of the, uh, the mixed media here. <laughs> if you haven't seen these ads, they are on, on uh, the ones website and they are really quite remarkable. 
some of that. Um, next, I'm going to ask David Donnelly, who's the National Campaigns Director for Public Campaign Action Fund, to talk about how you make corruption an issue, the larger sense of the campaign. Oh, yes, sir. Thank you, Alan. Thank you, Eli. Um, I think you have it exactly right. We really do need to connect uh, the corruption that happens here day in, day out, not the the scandals that we're reading about every day and the headlines, the stuff that is, uh, you know, certainly uh, looks illegal. We need to connect the, the, the legal bribery that happens day in, day out to people's lives and how it impacts um, uh, people in their uh, in their everyday life of paying for gas, um, higher gas prices and and, uh, and drug prices and the like. I mean, let's not mix any words though. All corruption is bad, and we should get rid of it. The ninety thousand dollars down in the freezer. And that doesn't reflect well on any of us who are on public service. Um, but that $90,000 in a freezer didn't increase anyone's prescription drug prices. That, uh, those boxing tickets that uh, Senate Minority Leader Harry Reid was um, uh, accused of taking uh, from a, a gaming commission in Nevada didn't make people's gas prices go up. It didn't make people's lives uh, worse. The corruption that Tom DeLay and his K Street project uh, practiced uh, day in, day out here in Congress that made Americans' lives uh, worse. We've been working on this type of messaging since 2002 when we unveiled a campaign in the Arkansas Senate race, uh, criticizing Tim Hutchinson for listening too much to his donors and not too much, not as much uh, to voters back home. Working with Acorn on the ground in, uh, in Arkansas, we uh, unveiled uh, several different uh, advertisements and worked with uh, grassroots organizers there to deliver a message on minimum wage and the corporate money that Tim Hutchinson had taken the, and the seven votes he had cast against minimum wage on, uh, on uh, Social Security and the Wall Street money that Tim Hutchinson had taken and, and his uh, proposal to privatize Social Security, a variety of other policies that uh, hurt regular uh, voters back home. And uh, Tim Hutchinson was the only Republican uh, senator to lose his re-election uh, that year, in a year that um, found uh, many uh, Republicans return to office. We think this cost of corruption uh, message is incredibly important to layer issue after issue after issue and connect a narrative across important issues that we and the voters care about with a uh, message of money and politics and it ties those issues together, uh, raises questions about a candidate's character because they're willing to do something for money and willing to sell out their constituents on issue after issue. And it puts those politicians into a box, into a box of the typical politician that cares more about Washington than the constituents at home. We plan on unveiling with Campaign for America's Future uh, a campaign in 10 to 12 congressional districts this year to do just that in some uh, highly competitive uh, districts held by incumbents here in Washington. In addition, we think it's important to work on, um, uh, on the reform side of things and cleaning up uh, this mess. And so we're working with a variety of organizations, Common Cause, Public Citizen, uh, U.S. Per, and a variety of others on, uh, on unveiling a, a Clean Up Congress pledge, which will be uh, rolling out in, in, a, in, a, seven, in a, a few weeks to, um, uh, to link a number of issues, uh, public financing of elections, clean elections like the past in a variety of states around the country, a uh, uh, transparency pledge, uh, cracking down on, on the ethics and lobbying uh, excesses here in Washington as part of a three-part pledge to hold candidates accountable so when they do get elected, they come here to Congress, they have to do something serious to clean it up. Um, we'll be kicking off that effort at a series of house parties around the country. I think many of you have probably heard about Clean Money Day and the big buy, the Tom DeLay movie uh, that has been showcased here at this great conference. Uh, June 27th is, is, uh, uh, is Clean Money Day where we're having these movies shown around the country at house parties. I encourage you to sign up uh, to do house parties. Um, let me just and by saying, I think um, it's important to make these issues uh, voting issues. Uh, it's important to make them voting issues because it's who, um, because they, they, they go uh, uh, directly to who controls our politics. Are our politics control, controlled by those who have the wealth uh, and the access to influence members of Congress? Or are our politics, are our elections controlled by those of us who uh, you know, work every day or those of us who uh, don't have the resources to, uh, to run for office or to, to influence a politician. I think using this uh, message uh, um, raises the stakes on our elected officials to do the right thing uh, when they come back here next year uh, after a, uh, uh, what will hopefully be a successful election. Thank you. Thank you, David.
I would also urge everyone who's interested in this issue to regularly check uh, Public Campaign Action Fund's blog. And uh, David, why don't you tell us what the sure the, the uh, URL, the URL is, is campaignmoney.org. Campaignmoney.org. Uh, it's a must for anybody who's reading this. It really is the leading blog on uh, corruption, political corruption today. So don't listen to David. Um, next, um, I would like to introduce uh, David Bookbinder, who is an attorney with the Sierra Club um, Environmental Law Program. And he's going to talk about the oil industry and um, oil industry money and energy costs. Good morning. Uh, I was one of the lawyers who litigated the case against uh, Vice President Cheney and his energy task force. And that case really has, it contains within it three different types of corruption. The first is the most obvious one that we're all familiar with, which is it was the Energy Task Force was payback. Uh, George W. Bush was sworn into office on January 20th, 2001, a day we'll all live to regret. Um, and the Energy Task Force was established January 29th, 2001. They lo lost no time getting that one set up. And it was stacked from the beginning, uh, as, and it was designed to be a payback to the campaign donors from the oil, coal, and nuclear energy industries. Um, Paul O'Neill, the former Secretary of the Treasury, quotes Christine Todd Whitman coming out of one of these meetings. And the formal Energy Task Force had 12 members, 12 cabinet level appointees. And Paul O'Neill quotes Christine Todd Whitman as saying, it's really brutal in there. It's 10 versus 2 in there, not including all the energy industry people. Uh, that's a quote from one cabinet member talking about another. The odd thing is, of course, Christy Todd Whitman and was in thinking of herself and Gail Norton as being the good guys, which gives you some idea of, of what was really happening in there. The result of that task force was an energy bill that contained nothing but billions of dollars in giveaways to the oil industry, opening up federal lands, direct subsidies, billions of dollars of more to the coal industry, guarantees to the nuclear industry, waivers of Clean Air Act protections, Clean Water Act protections, etc. It was just a huge industry boondoggle such that John McCain nicknamed it the No Lobbyist Left Behind Act. That was the first and most obvious sort of corruption. The second sort of corruption was something that caught the public eye, was the, the famous duck hunt scandal. When Justice Scalia, when the case was in front of the Supreme Court, Justice Scalia flies down on Air Force Two to go duck hunting for the weekend with the Vice President at the hunting retreat of an energy industry lobbyist. I mean, it was just perfect. The, the resulting outcry was remarkable. Uh, I'm very proud of the job that America did, saying something's wrong here. This doesn't look right. Now, I, we were not going to get Justice Scalia's vote no matter what. That was that was a given. And but, and we sat back and waited and just to see what would happen. And there was a groundswell of opinion across America that this is wrong. This looks wrong. These two people should not be off drinking beer and shooting ducks together while this case is pending in the Supreme Court. It looks bad, and it's a corruption of the legal process. And we asked Justice Scalia to recuse himself. Uh, it's the only time I've submitted a brief to the Supreme Court that contained many cartoons in it of the Scalia and Cheney duck hunt. Um, and Justice Scalia said no, and about a month ago said it was the proudest moment of his legal career that he didn't recuse himself in that case. And I thought it was a very sad statement of what, of, of a long and truly it, it, a distinguished legal career that he would call his refusal to step down in that case the proudest moment of his legal career. The third sort of corruption that came out as a, re, that, that came about as a result of the task force is the most serious. In the first kind, so you know, you, you pay back your campaign contributors with billions of dollars to the treasury. That's that's business as usual. You get a dumb judge doing dumb things in the public eye. That's usual. But the third sort of corruption is the most dangerous, and it's the hallmark of this administration. And the corruption is 
the legal positions that the Bush administration took in the litigation, that any inquiry by the judicial branch into any activity of the executive branch was per se unconstitutional. It was, it was breathtaking. It was a position not even advocated by the Nixon White House during Watergate. This went beyond their claims. And I'll close by just reading you a brief note. I'm oh, sorry. Any, any legal inquiry by the, by the judicial branch into executive branch affairs was per se unconstitutional. And in the words of Judge Emmett Sullivan here in Washington, the implications of the bright line rule advocated by the government are stunning. Even if this court were to consider the question of what separation of powers standard to apply without the benefit of precedent, it would reach the conclusion that the government's position is untenable. Such a ruling in the government's favor would eviscerate the understanding of checks and balances between the three branches of government on which our constitutional order depends. And that is the biggest danger we face from this White House. Very sobering. Somebody once, a political consultant who has to be named, as it was said to me, has to be unnamed, because it was said to me in confidence, said to me once, if somebody knew how bad it was in Washington, they'd come to the Capitol and burn it down. I'm not advocating that. But I think what David has just told us is a reminder of just how bad things are in Washington. And because nobody knows better how bad things are in the world of the drug companies and the Medicare Social Security world than my colleague, Roger Hickey. I'm going to ask him to come up and remind us of what's happening in that arena. Thanks. Thank you. 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 Thank
uh, with the people or with the energy. And we can do it on health care, certainly, um, with the Medicare prescription drug plan. Jan Schakowsky has developed a, an alternative fix to the, to the Medicare prescription drug uh, program that Bush has given us, and you're either for it or against it. You're either for the drug companies or against the drug companies. Um, and I think we can do it on democracy, and we need to be creative about that. Uh, but I want to enlist you all in a citizen's army to challenge the candidates everywhere they show up. You don't have to wait for the, ad, the TV ads. You don't have to wait for anything except your friends and neighbors demanding an audience with the members of Congress or candidates and publicizing that when it happens. Publicizing their answers, uh, taking their answers to the public and forcing the media to report on them. We can challenge the political system by letting people know where these politicians stand, and we can use every single technique that people have been talking about up here to do that. So let's get to work. Thank you. Thanks, Robert. It's when you feel you need to take off to, uh, uh, to prepare for the, uh, the final luncheon, please do so. Um, and um, now I want to introduce uh, Anya, is it Kamenetz? Yes. It's lucky on that. Um, to talk about the cost of college and the role of money politics. And um, I want to make sure that, uh, that everybody has a copy of this postcard for her uh, new book. So if you didn't get one, we have more up front. Thanks a lot. Uh, thanks for having me here. Um, so I'm a journalist who writes about the problems of student loan debt uh, and what a student opportunity in, in this country and to the prospects of individuals. And I'm here today to talk about the relationship between one company, Sally May, and federal government, which has shifted uh, federal student aid from something that's supposed to be about opening opportunity to students into uh, just a huge money maker for one company that dominates the entire industry. Um, so basically, uh, this is something that's grown really, really quickly and under the radar in about the past two decades. Um, in 1993-94, as recently as then, uh, less than half of all students were borrowing for college, and today about two-thirds of all students are borrowing for college. They're graduating with about $19,000 in student loan debt. And um, likewise, the annual volume of all federal student loans has uh, increased 141% uh, in the last decade or so, 26 billion in 1993, uh, 63 billion in 2004. Um, and at the same time, there's been a tremendous, tremendous, much faster growth in the volume of private student loans, which are made by lenders without federal backing. Uh, those loans have grown, grew in the same time period, 93 to 2004, from 1.3 billion to 14 billion, so it's a 10 times increase. Um, and that's a really important number for reasons I'll, hope, I'll have time to get into. Um, so Sally Mae, Sally Mae was created by Nixon as a government-sponsored entity in 1972, just like Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac to create a secondary market for student loans. So the concern at that point was that there wouldn't be enough capital that banks would want to lend out student loans. Sally Mae has created these treasury funds to buy back student loans from the banks and thus provide the banks with more capital to make more student loans. Um, by the 80s, Sally Mae was already doing so well, student loans turned out to be a lucrative market, pretty low default market. Um, so Sally Mae turned to Wall Street for its capital. And because of its implicit backing from the federal government, was able to uh, raise enormous amounts of capital uh, during the 80s and early 90s. Their, their uh, assets multiplied eight times. Um, and in the late 80s, early 90s, there started to be a crackdown in the student loan market, um, looking at the huge salaries, looking at the connections with the federal government. Um, and so Clinton campaigned in 1992 to create the direct loan program. Um, he wanted to eradicate student lenders out of the business and create a program where the government uh, lended money directly from the Treasury to students. And uh, instead, uh, after meetings took resistance, officials uh, phased in the direct loan initiative alongside the Guaranteed Student Loan Program. Um, within only a few years, uh, direct loans had more borrowed funding policies. They grew to be one third of all student loans. And Sally May saw that its existence was threatened. And there was a shareholder's revolt. And Albert Lord took over. And he vowed to privatize the company to trickle its assets and to move from origin to, to originating these student loans from simply having a secondary market. Um, in the Supreme move of Chutzpah, Sally May actually, and other student lenders actually sued the Secretary of Education in 2000 
uh, for offering discounts and interest rates and fees on direct loans to make them more competitive with guaranteed student loans, um, saying that the Secretary has unfairly made these taxpayer-funded benefits available only to the minority of borrowers that choose the direct loan program. Meanwhile, they're discounting their loans right and left, but they're not allowing the federal government to compete. Um, and so, basically, uh, you know, we now have 10 years of government data on direct loans showing that they are many, many times cheaper than federally guaranteed student loans, which are a billions of dollars uh, in a year industry. Uh, uh, from 2004, OMB figures show that direct loans uh, cost one cent on the dollar compared to 12 cents on the dollar for guaranteed student loans, and that's including all administrative expenses. Um, you know, they, there's there's very general, uh, you know, just an interesting side note is that, actually it's not a side note, it's pretty central. Uh, John Boehner, House Majority Leader, uh, his entire run for the House Majority Leader was financed essentially by the, uh, the student lenders as well as the for-profit higher education companies which are founded to run on federal student loans. Um, and they underwrote it to a very great extent. They underwrite, they're the biggest, Salome's the biggest contributor to his PAC. Uh, John Boehner's daughter, Trisha, works for a Salome-owned company. Uh, John Boehner took many golf outings. Um, I'm sure these are all familiar details to you. Uh, something that might be interesting also is that uh, I, earlier this year I talked with a person who worked in the Office of Federal Student Aid who asked to be anonymous, and he talked about uh, how policies change toward direct loans once uh, Bush got into office. He said, um, the people Bush got in told us we were no longer to give speeches about the direct loan program, talk to colleges, publish any brochures or reports, make any hires. The annual direct loans conference was canceled. Our communications person wasn't allowed to talk to the press without a Bush appointee in the room. You almost have to ask permission to go to the bathroom and you never got it. Um, if you're interested in corruption in the student loan program, there's a fantastic bill that was just introduced by Hillary Clinton uh, on May 26th, uh, which is Borrower's Bill of Rights, which is going to threaten to take away many, many of the privileges that the uh, student lenders enjoy. And I'm looking forward to this becoming an issue in the 2006 election and beyond. This issue, uh, and it, it clearly deserves very close following. Um, Anya has a blog, and uh, so I would urge you to, to uh, sign on to that. Why don't you tell us what the URL is? Oh, sure. Well, it's myname.blogspot.com. So, What's the name of your book? The name of my book is Generation Debt. Generation Debt, and I assume there are copies uh, to be sold. I'll be signing it after this. Session. She'll be signing it, indeed. Are you selling? Yes, we are selling it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, in that room that goes. Straight through there. Um, all right, we have a few minutes for questions, uh, maybe 15 minutes for questions. So I'll just randomly select people. Uh, in, uh, just behind you. Uh, you, yes. yes. I, don't, I don't want to bash this party here, but um, I see also a problem of corruption within the Democratic Party. And the corruption starts not with taking money as such, it starts with with the fear to take take responsibility, to be a leader, to tell people the truth. And uh, although I see the corruption, uh, the money taken you know, by pharmaceutical uh, companies, this kind of stuff, there's also big finance, uh, big banks being behind the corruption within the Democratic Party that leads to the Democratic Party of Democrats. Now, I would like you to. Uh, Stand up. Actually, if you want to win the next election, you should tell people the truth that this economic system is about to collapse and you need a new system. Uh, thank you for your question. It's a good question. Um, David. Uh, th there are lots of examples of, uh, of money influencing politicians on both sides of the aisle. We have to make no bones about that. And you know, certainly one example was the bankruptcy bill. Uh, that was pushed through Congress after seven years of, uh, of uh, contributions and lobbying from the credit card and banking industry, uh, which literally makes it harder for um, uh, working Americans to get out of debt, uh, but doesn't do a thing about any bankruptcy filings uh, by, by corporations. And it's a way for the credit card companies simply to, uh, you know, to make more money. Uh, it's really an egregious, uh, egregious piece of legislation. And on that bill, there were Democrats and Republicans that supported it because uh, both parties um, 
uh, members of both parties have received contributions from the credit card industry over so many years. They've been pushing for this for years. It's, uh, uh, it's, it's, it's one of the most recent examples, but there are lots of examples. Um, right here in the front row. Yeah, I, I have a uh, question on something. I'm thinking about things that sound wrong, smell wrong, something that you heard earlier on. And what has puzzled me, this is kind of off the subject here that's going on. It seems to me that a fellow named Bob Trump was running a lot of Democratic campaigns. And if I understanding correctly, everyone who ran, ran was lost. I understand if I remember correctly, Mondale, Potter, and Spore. Um, what? And the said we had something to smell. Like, why would the Democratic Party continue to hire <laughs> It, it is uh, a bit of an aside uh, from our panel. Does anybody want to? Um... <laughs> I, I, I think I think you're confusing uh, corrupt with dumb. Uh, <laughs> All right, let's take a question. Uh, you had a question. Speak loudly since we don't have mics. Is, is very perceptive. The answer is that we're not invoking the theory of the unitary executive. They didn't, that wasn't related to the doctrine that they were trying to, to, to push upon the courts, that courts had no business inquiring into executive branch affairs. The unitary executive is slightly different. Both theories, however, lead to the same result, which is a vastly more powerful uh, executive branch um, and in the signing statement issue that you talk about where the president uh, takes a bill and says, Congress has passed this bill, Congress has a legislative history of it, but I'm going to now write my own little history of what this bill really means when I sign it. Uh, yet another way of trying to aggrandize uh, presidential power. Um, all three are, they, they don't relate to each other directly, but all three are designed, explicitly designed to increase executive branch power, and all three are equally dangerous. Do you, is there a coming up before the Supreme Court where they can codify that, or they can basically? No, not, not right now. Okay. Um, right here, then. Thank you, Jack. Well, it's just from San Diego. Uh, Eli, a bunch of us were sitting around dinner a couple nights ago, we were talking about the red-handed ad, and I had to see it. It's wonderful, and I can see it's very effective. the possibility of that international and being used in dozens of campaigns. What do you think of that? Uh, I think it would be great. Uh, <laughs> and we're talking with, with folks about how to make that happen. Yes, you are. Um, no, you know, there's no copyright problem? Or no, I mean, we would love to see people, you know, actually people are picking up the red-handed thing on their own. I ran into a candidate uh, today from Florida who said that he was he was doing this. And I heard a great story also from Connecticut, which I just have to share, uh, where uh, one of our targets, Nancy Johnson in Connecticut, went into a uh, a Connecticut uh, a classroom and was talking to the to the students. These were kind of young high school students, I guess, and uh, and so she was talking about what it's like to be a representative and how great it is to be in Congress and so forth. And uh, after she was done talking, someone, you know, this girl uh, in the back row raised her hand, and she called on her and she said, are you the lady with the red hands? <laughs> <laughs> so the word is getting around. Uh, and we would love to see it picked up as much as possible, yeah. I, 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 wait, uh, excuse me, one second. 
I, I just um, I want to make sure that lots of people have an opportunity to talk. I, I just wanted to comment. I can imagine people starting to go around and dyeing their hands red. But you know, it, just, it becomes a movement or something. Uh, yes, a lady in the back there. I'm the voting integrity editor for Op-Ed News Progressive website, and I want to applaud all your efforts about um, bringing out corruption. And I'd like to know what your plans are also regarding electronic voting and the electoral process itself, since without changes there, none of this other stuff can happen. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Eli, are you working on that? Yeah, uh, and I, I totally agree. I think. Uh, these things go hand in hand. They're ways that of taking uh, the the decision of who you know who's elected our leaders away from the people who are supposed to be uh, making it. That's what corruption is all about. And I think the issue with electronic voting is is really important for us. Uh, the way we're going at that is with a two two prong strategy. Uh, one is on the federal level pushing legislation, and there are a bunch of different pieces uh, that get at this. Um, that uh, you know that that will solve this problem on the federal on the federal level. Um, Republicans are holding that up currently in the House. It's very frustrating, but uh, so so we're not waiting for them to to move. So we're also working on the state by state level. And one thing that people don't actually know is that 26 states so far have have passed some kind of paper trail uh, type legislation. So we are making progress uh, on this on this issue. And uh, in a lot of states also this year, there are Secretary of State candidates who are up. Uh, there's a great one in California uh, who is, you know, who is going to take this issue head on if she's elected. So we're going to we're going to look at supporting those people as well. Um, but it's absolutely a, a critical issue. And one other thing I'll add is, for a while, this issue has been asymmetrical. It's been an issue that people on the progressive side are upset about because we know uh, that these people have the motive and the means. Uh, to to take control of our elections if they if they wish, and um, and on the on the Republican side among the grassroots, even though this is an issue that really is not a partisan issue, it affects everyone. Uh, there hasn't been that kind of groundswell. Last week on his program, Lou Dobbs uh, started raising this issue uh, in a very populist way. Uh, and he's talking about, I guess, some company in Venezuela that that Sequoia. bought machines. Um, Sequoia, right? that's, I, I guess so, yeah. And so, and I think this is a breakthrough moment for the issue because I think that if we can convince folks on the right as well that this is a serious threat to democracy, that's when we're going to make a difference. And I think, you know, for however dem demagogic uh, Dobbs is. I think it's a moment when we can actually get a bipartisan consensus together to fix this thing once and for all. All right. Um, right there. I just want to follow up on that. That's a critically important issue. And this, all the panelists have talked about the corruption of money in our government, which is critical. And also, the elephant in the room here is about the corruption in our voting system. And in 19, uh, 2004, I set up the group on the vote to investigate presidential election, I'm shocked at the depth and breadth of problems, both the vulnerability to human fraud and the possibility of mechanical failure. We have lost our democracy in this country. If you can just ask two questions, do you know when you vote, your vote is counted as you cast it? Secondly, after the election, do you know that when the votes are counted, can you check it with a recount? And in many, many places, the answer to both those questions is no. Until we do that, we have lost our democracy. And even the money issue is critical as it is, and I've supported your work for years, that uh, if, when they can control the election system, they don't need the money. They can figure out who's going to win no matter who's got money from where. It takes them off the hook for the money problem. So I think this is a huge issue. I'm concerned this has not been raised more effectively in this program. Because we've just spent three days talking about uh, programs and policies, all of which are critical. But I can tell you, no matter what our policy positions, no matter what candidates are running, no matter how much money we have, no matter if we get public financing in every state, until we restore integrity to our voting system, we have lost our democracy and we won't win. It's our first and primary priority. Let me, uh, let me urge you uh, to make 
make sure that the leaders of the conference and Campaign for America's Future uh, hear your comments. I'm sure they will have feedback forms. They have feedback forms, of course. They're apparently yellow. Uh, make sure that, uh, because again, people are responsive to what they, uh, the people want to talk about in sympathy. It is really hard, even in a three-day conference, to do every issue. But let's make sure that, that's, that your voice is heard on that. Um, back there. Yeah, hi, Bill Easton from Work Assets in San Francisco. My question is primarily to you, David, although Eli, you might be able to comment on it as well. The, uh, the Brent Wilkes, Stu Cunningham, MGM, money going through black budget, CIA stuff that you then got funneled around to Republican candidates. We just saw the President use a signing statement to say that the uh, Office of the Inspector General will not have the power to investigate $9 billion that's gone missing in Iraq question another 12 billion that was shipped directly from Federal Reserve Banks over to Iraq. They threw this money around like footballs. Do you think any of that, I mean, is, it, is that money just sort of going to disappear? Will there, will there ever be any follow-up on that? And do you think any of that funneled its way right back through Halliburton and is now working against us? <laughs> oh, David is chomping at the bit. All you have to do is say <laughs> Halliburton. Yeah, the question is, it's amazing how how web-like this corruption is. I mean, you know one of Fred Wilk's favorite golf buddies was Tom DeLay. Um, I know a little bit about Tom DeLay. We used to run the Daily Delay blog, and we're the first organization to take him on in his district in 2004. Um, we, uh, you know, I, I don't know whether we'll ever know where that $9 billion went or, um, or whether it's made its way back here. Uh, I certainly think that, uh, you know, that, that the, the contracts in, in Iraq need to be audited um, uh, and audited thoroughly and audited again. Um, but I, uh, um, I agree with you, it's, a, it's an incredible story that now Bush has prevented a full investigation into this. Um, but I think it's going to take a you know a significant citizen effort to you know push the next next um, Congress and perhaps the next administration to really dig up uh, what happened. We need a we need a, a Truman like commission um, to really do a fact finding about the profiteering that's been happening in Iraq. I mean that's really what this country needs. Let me just um, add that uh, one of the things that the Sunlight Foundation is interested in. Uh, is uh, transparency for government contracts. And to that end, uh, the uh, organization OMB Watch will have a grants and contracts database uh, up and available for public search, electronic uh, searchable database. It will be up by September 1st. So that may at least be able to keep the conversation going. We'll see what, we, what comes out of that. Helen, can I just add two quick thoughts? Uh, one is, one thing we have learned uh, and Pacey can attest to this. Uh, sorry, Pacey. Uh, is uh, that the word Halliburton is like kryptonite to Republicans? You mention it in an ad, you talk about it, uh, and people, it reminds them of everything that's going wrong in Iraq, all of the profiteering, all of the waste. Um, and, and so even though we may not know, you know where that $9 billion went, talking about Halliburton. Yeah, see how many times you can get it into a sentence when you're at the next uh, <laughs> town meeting. Um, we also invoke Dick Cheney. Right, that's right. Uh, the second thing is people uh, sometimes say, you know, okay, I'm, I'm looking at these elections this fall, but, it, and, but, but it, you know, is this really going to change anything? Is this going to, you know, if we win, win back the House, can we really actually stop these guys? And I think this is a clear example of the kind of thing that we will be able to investigate. Uh, if, if Democrats win back the House, we will have subpoena power. We'll have subpoena power. And that means we can call these people in front of Congress and demand answers and not let them off the hook until they do. And so when your energy's flagging and you're knocking on your fifth door uh, or, or whatever you're going to do to get out the vote, this, you know, remember that, subpoena power. It's a seven-letter word, but it makes all the difference. <laughs>